Mesdames et messieurs, Ladies and gentlemen, I am very glad as the Vice President of the University of Geneva and in the name of Jean-Dominique Vassali, who is not present tonight in Geneva, to welcome you to this important conference dedicated to language and more specifically to the links between language and cognition. I am also very honored to welcome our speaker, Noam Chomsky. His work on language are considered to be uh, one of the most important contributions to the domain of linguistics, theoretical linguistics in the 20th century. He's a linguist, but also a philosopher, an activist, and a political thinker. Noam Chomsky is known the world over for his very popular books on the foreign policy of the US and on the functioning of the media. Noam Chomsky is also considered to be the greatest living intellectual, according to a survey done in 2005 on the great intellectuals of the world, published by the magazine Prospect, a British newspaper magazine. Linguistics, modern linguistics, are a science that was born in the University of Geneva, thanks to the work of the linguist, Geneva-born linguist, Ferdinand de Saussure. So Saussurean linguistics have had an, a crucial influence on the evolution of linguistics in the 20th century, notably on the development of structural analysis of language. 2013 marks the exact centenary of the death of Ferdinand de Saussure and thereby offers an opportunity to evaluate the prospects of linguistics. Indeed, new fields of investigation have opened, giving way to a number of new hypotheses. It is with this in mind that the University of Geneva, uh, with uh, the uh, permanent committee, the standing committee of uh, the Congress of Linguists, uh, and with uh, the support of uh, several institutions, the Academy for Social Sciences, the um, uh, Swiss Foundation, the Foundation Latsis, um, a secret the Secretariat for Innovation and um, Research, the Geneva um, Institution for the Distribution um, of uh, Lottery Gains, and in partnership with the Swiss Society for Linguistics, we are very honored to welcome this year the 19th International Congress of Linguists. For uh, several days now, almost a thousand participants who have come from every corner of the world have uh, convened to discuss and to interact around the theme, the interface cognition language. All the areas of modern linguistics, such as um, phonology, formology, uh, syntax, semantics, pragmatics, or uh, psycholinguistic, uh, psycholinguistics and sociolinguistics, are touched upon through sessions and workshops with approximately 750 contributions. I'd like to say that this important conference has been organized thanks to the contribution of the organizers of the 19th International Congress of Linguists and thanks to the support of the Latsis Foundation. I'd like to say that after this conference, a question and answer session will take place in this very room. It will be mod moderated by Stephen Anderson. He is chairman of the Scientific Committee of the Congress. Without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Ur Shlansky, who is professor at the Department of Linguistics at the University. Thank you for your attention. Bonsoir. Good evening. Present, to present the work of Noam Chomsky is an impossible task. For several years now, wrote Noam Chomsky in 1986, I have been intrigued by two problems concerning human knowledge. The first problem that Chomsky called the problem of Orwell is that of explaining how we know so little when there is so much to lead us to evidence and knowledge. The answer that Chomsky gives to the Orwell problem in many works is the following. Mm, systems of propaganda. He has dedicated a great part of his life to analyzing these systems. When I started to read Chomsky, wrote Arundhati Roy in 2003, 
I thought that um, this deployment of arguments, their quantity, their um, implacable quality were, were a little bit mind-boggling. A quarter of his arguments would have been enough to convince me. I was accustomed to asking myself why he had to work so much. But now I understand that the breadth and the intensity of his work are a measure of the breadth and the scope um, of the machine of propaganda that he has to face. The second problem of human knowledge, which has always interested Noam Chomsky, is in a way the counterpart of the other. He calls it the Plato problem. How is it that we know so much when the evidence that could lead us to all this knowledge is so limited? In particular, how come do we know not language? Four fundamental questions define uh, Chomsky's program in linguistics. Firstly, how can we describe and analyze the ability for language in adult speakers? How does this knowledge develop in the human organism? And how does this knowledge, uh, how is this knowledge mobilized in the language practice of speakers? And what are the physical and neurological mechanisms um, that are necessary to its knowledge and mobilization? This program defines a framework for a science. and. Any natural science starts by enigmas, by the capacity to be puzzled. Language is full of puzzles, and its scientific study starts when we stop saying that's just the way it is, and when we start to look for explanations. In a recent article, Chomsky illustrates one of these enigmas. Instinctively, eagles that fly swim. He makes us notice in this sentence that the adverb instinctively cannot be associated to the verb swim. The sentence expresses the thought that eagles which fly instinctively swim, and not the thought that uh, eagles that fly instinctively instinctively swim. Why? So for the French speakers among us, this is interesting. In the following sentence, all of the girls eat the pies, it's all the girls and not all of the pies. This changes when you say all, uh, when, when you say the girls eat all of the pies, where all is associated to pies. Upon reflection, we realize that all of the, that the all is, associ is associated to girls. We could say, all the girls play in the park, or all the girls play um, uh, speak French. So why? Why do we associate different words with others? We are um, daily confronted with this kind of enigma, and generally, we don't even realize that they are there, and when we do realize, we treat them as oddities. The contribution of Noam Chomsky is in the fact that he started being surprised by the properties of human language and by bringing a reasonable, um, reasoned, rational thinking and turned mysteries into problems. And he created a science, thereby linguistics. Chomsky has taught most of the people sitting in this hall. And I can honestly say and I believe I'm speaking for many of us, that Noam has had an enormous influence on our adult life. The International Congress of Linguists, the University of Geneva, and I are extremely honored by his presence. Please give a warm welcome to Noam Chomsky. As the announcement uh, indicates, this is a personal perspective. Uh, there's no consensus on the topics that I'm going to talk about, and I 
presume my own view is a minority view in the whole range of uh, related fields that intersect more or less in this area. There is a consensus on one matter. Uh, from the second half of the 20th century, there's been a huge explosion of uh, inquiry into language by any means we take, say, counting the number of people at this con Congress and the range of topics they're talking about and the uh, depth of the commentary. A far more penetrating work has been underway on a vastly greater uh, variety of typologically uh, varied languages, uh, many new topics that have been opened, uh, the kinds of questions that students are working on today that uh, could not be formulated or even imagined uh, half a century ago, or for that matter, considerably more recently. And the uh, new problems and puzzles are uh, coming into view more rapidly than older ones are being at least partially resolved. Now, those are all exciting signs of a lively uh, array of interlinked disciplines. I have my own reservations, which I'll come back to. Uh, I think it's fair to, change, uh, to trace this quite sharp and unmistakable change in large part to new options that became available by mid 20th century for considering more seriously the most fundamental question we can ask about language, namely, what is it? Uh, by that point, uh, advances in the formal sciences enabled a clear formulation of uh, what we should recognize to be the most basic property of language. I'll just refer to it as the basic property, uh, that each language provides an unbounded array of hierarchically structured expressions, uh, which uh, receive interpretations at, uh, in roughly thought and roughly sound, two interfaces. Uh, that allows a substantive formulation of uh, common sense uh, dictum, Aristotle's dictum, that language is sound with meaning. Uh, although work of recent years uh, has shown, and some of the talks here uh, discuss it, that uh, sound is too narrow. And there's good reason to which I'll return to think that the common sense classic formulation is misleading in significant ways. Uh, at the very least, uh, each language incorporates a computational procedure satisfying the basic property. Uh, therefore, every theory of a particular language is by definition what's called a generative grammar, and each language is uh, at least uh, what has come to be called an I language. I here stands for individual, internal, and intentional, intentional, that's with an S for the technically minded among you. Uh, we're interested in discovering the actual computational procedure, not some set of objects that it enumerates, uh, what in technical terms, what it strongly generates. Uh, there's, there are other notions, uh, weak generation, and uh, what some people, not me, call e-language, uh, whatever they are, maybe nothing. Uh, those are derivative notions at best, if they're even definable for natural language. Uh, probably not, in my opinion. But uh, these are topics discussed extensively uh, 50, 60 years ago. And they seem to have been often forgotten. Uh, among the various approaches to language and questions of language, uh, each should recognize at least that language is a property of an individual person, internal, mostly to the mind, brain. Uh, it's what's now called the biolinguistic framework. Now, this framework should be uncontroversial and recognized to be a prerequisite to other inquiries, numerous other questions that uh, can be raised, questions of the kind that are discussed in the talks here. 
Uh, questions about acquisition, uh, use of language, uh, language in society, uh, uh, internal mechanisms that implement the system, uh, both the system of knowledge itself and, uh, the system and the various uses of it, different but related questions. Uh, evidently, uh, inquiry into those further questions must rely on guidelines that are provided by an answer to the question of what language is, maybe tacit answer, but some answer. Uh, that shouldn't be controversial either. So for example, no biologist would propose an account of the development or evolution of the eye without telling us something about what an eye is. And the same holds for inquiries into language. Uh, in earlier years, the basic property resisted clear formulation. I'll just illustrate with some of the classics. So for example, for the Saussure, the language in the relevant sense uh, is a storehouse of, quoting a storehouse of word images in the brains of a collectivity of individuals founded on what he called a sort of contract. Uh, for Leonard Bloomfield, uh, the language is an array of habits to respond to situations with conventional speech sounds and to respond to these sounds with actions. He actually gave a different a conception in his uh, postulates for the science of language. He defined language as the totality of utterances made in a speech community. Uh, that's something like uh, William D Dwight Whitney's uh, uh, earlier conception of language as the sum of words and phrases by which any man expresses his thought. So audible thinking in his phrase, although that's actually a slightly different conception in ways to which I'll return. Uh, the other grand old man of American linguistics, Edward Sapir, defines language as a purely human and non-distinctive method of communicating ideas, emotions, and desires by means of a system of voluntarily produced symbols. With conceptions like these, it's natural to follow what uh, Martin Jose, important linguist of 60 years ago, uh, what he called uh, the Boazian tradition, named after Franz Boas, uh, which holds that languages can differ arbitrarily and that each new language must be studied without any preconceptions. So, According to that view, a linguistic theory just consists of analytic procedures to reduce a collection of material, a corpus of material to some organized form, uh, basically techniques of segmentation and classification. Uh, the shift of perspective to generative grammar within the biolinguistic framework uh, opened the way to much more far-reaching inquiry into language itself and language-related topics. And it, it also greatly enriched the variety of evidence that bears on the study of each individual language. So it can include essentially anything, uh, acquisition, uh, use, uh, uh, neuroscience, dissociations, uh, much else. And it can also include what has been learned from the study of other languages. Uh, that's on the quite well-confirmed assumption that the capacity for language relies on shared biological properties. Uh, that's the topic of what in the last 50 years has been called universal grammar, UG. It's adapting a traditional term to a different framework, different concept. Uh, in earlier years, it was understandable that the question, what is language, received only such indefinite answers as the ones I've mentioned all of them, notice, ignoring the basic property. It's, however, I think surprising to find that similar answers remain current in contemporary cognitive science. Uh, one typical example, current study on evolution of language in the journal Frontiers of Psychology, uh, character, characterizes language only as the full suite of abilities to map sound to meaning. That's basically a reiteration of Aristotle's dictum. It's much too empty to ground further inquiry. Again, no biologist would study 
evolution of the visual system, paraphrasing, assuming no more about the phenotype, that it provides the full suite of abilities to map stimuli to percepts. Couldn't get anywhere with that. And you couldn't publish a paper on it either. Uh, the editors in the audience might take that to heart. Uh, there are also uh, broader reasons to be concerned with the question, what is language? There's a rather clear indication of these, given in a recent book by one of the leading scientists who studies human evolution in Tattersall. There's a recent review of the currently available scientific evidence. Uh, he observes, I'll quote him now, it was once believed that the evolutionary record would yield early harbingers of our later selves. The reality, however, is otherwise, for it's becoming increasingly clear that the acquisition of the uniquely modern human sensibility was instead an abrupt and recent event, uh, which he dates in the very narrow window of roughly 50 to 100,000 years ago from an evolutionary point of view. That's a flick of an eye. Uh, and continue to quote, the expression of this new sensibility was almost certainly crucially abetted by the invention of what is perhaps the single most remarkable thing about our modern selves, the language. And therefore, an answer to the question, uh, what is language, matters very greatly to anyone concerned with understanding our modern selves, what kind of creature we are. Uh, the founders of modern biology, of course, lacked the evidence of current science, but they adopted a general view that's not too different. So Darwin, for example, wrote that man differs from animals solely in his almost infinitely larger power of associating the most diversified sound and ideas. Modern terms, that means in having a generative grammar. Uh, phrase almost infinite is a traditional phrase that we have to interpret today as actually infinite, has no meaning, makes no sense to contemplate a, uh, a huge uh, non-extendable li list that's meaningless. Uh, much earlier at the origins of modern science, uh, Galileo was entranced by what he called that marvelous invention, he's referring to the alphabet, that provides the means to construct from 25 or 30 sounds that infinity of expressions that enable us to reveal everything that we think and all the movements of our soul. It's audible thought in Whitney's phrase, although Galileo went far beyond uh, Whitney in that he recognized the unbounded character of the language. It's kind of an obvious point, but very hard to find anyone who noticed it in the 2,500 years of serious investigation of language. Uh, the same recognition and a much deeper concern for kind of a creative character of the normal use of language uh, shortly after, a little after Galileo, that was to become a, a core element of Cartesian science, what's nowadays called philosophy, same thing as science in those days. Uh, there's no reason today to doubt the fundamental insight of Descartes that use of language, normal use of language, is indeed uh, a creative activity. It uh, is typically innovative, without bounds, so in principle infinite, it's appropriate to circumstances, but not caused by circumstances. It's a crucial distinction. And it can engender thoughts in others uh, that they recognize they could have expressed themselves. That's normal use. Uh, and the observation appears to be correct, as far as we know. Uh, there's, we, there is a, an aphorism uh, of uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt that's commonly quoted. Uh, pointing out that uh, language involves infinite use of finite means. But it's worth bearing in mind that he's talking about use. It's infinite use of finite means. Uh, more fully, he described the unending and truly boundless domain of language as the essence of all that can be thought. 
places him in the tradition of Galileo and others who associated language closely with thought. He actually went beyond to assert the identity of language and thought, it's a much stronger claim, while recognizing that, still quoting, language must make infinite employment of finite means in confronting its boundless domain. Uh, there has been great progress in understanding the finite means that make possible infinite use. But the infinite use itself uh, remains pretty much a mystery, despite, despite significant progress in some particular areas, like understanding uh, some of the conventions that guide appropriate use. But the basic problem remains as mysterious as it was for, for Descartes and the Cartesians. Uh, a century ago, another great linguist, Otto Jespersen, raised the question of how the elements of language come into existence in the mind of a speaker on the basis of finite experience. Another mystery, yielding, he said, a notion of structure that's definite enough to guide him in framing sentences of his own, crucially free expressions, typically new to speaker and hearer, over an unbounded range, hence infinite range. And then the task of the linguist, which he said, is to discover these mechanisms and uh, how they arise in the mind and to gain, I'm quoting him, a deeper insight into the innermost nature of human language and of human thought. Now, those ideas sound much less strange today than they did during the structuralist the behavioral science uh, uh, era that came to dominate uh, much of the field, uh, marginalizing uh, Jespersen's insights. So for example, when I was a student in the late 1940s, nobody ever heard of him. I found his work when wandering around the Harvard Library. Uh, well, reformulating Jespersen's program, uh, the basic task is to investigate the true nature of the interfaces and the generative procedures that relate them to determine how they arise in the mind and how they're used with the primary focus of concern and naturally being free expressions, the typically innovative creative behavior. Uh, as soon as the earliest attempts were made, roughly 60 years ago, to, to deal with these questions, to construct explicit generative grammars, uh, many puzzling phenomena were discovered which hadn't been noticed, although they're kind of obvious when you think about them, they hadn't been noticed as long as the basic property was not clearly formulated and addressed, and syntax was just considered use of words, uh, often use of words following the sequence of thoughts. Uh, Diderot famously uh, uh, argued that French would be the language of science, and German and English would be the language of, language of poetry because in French, the words follow exactly the order of thoughts, whereas in the other languages, it's kind of mixed up a bit, so it's better for fancy. Uh, you can determine how well that followed. Uh, this would, all of this is somewhat reminiscent of the earliest stages of modern science, early 17th century. So for millennia, scientists had been satisfied with very simple explanations for quite familiar phenomena. So rocks fall, steam rises, because they're seeking their natural place. Uh, objects interact because of what were called sympathies and antipathies, which bring them together, push them apart. Uh, we perceive a triangle because the shape of the triangle literally flits through the air and imprints itself on our, on our brain, uh, and so on. Lots of simple explanations. Uh, when Galileo and others uh, allowed themselves to be puzzled uh, about these facts, modern science began. And it was quickly discovered that our beliefs are mostly senseless and uh, our intuitions are all wrong. Uh, and it's worth remembering that the willingness to be puzzled is a very valuable trait to cultivate. 
That's from early education to the most advanced inquiry. Uh, one puzzle about language that came to light 60 years ago and remains alive, and I think is highly significant in its import, it has to do with a very simple but curious fact that we ought to find puzzling. So take, say, the sentence, instinctively eagles that fly swim. Uh, the adverb instinctively is associated with a verb, uh, but it's associated with swim, not fly. Uh, similarly, if you ask the question, can eagles that fly swim? Uh, that's about ability to swim, not ability to fly. Uh, there is a thought that the sentence fails to express, and it's quite difficult to formulate without circumlocution, as you can determine by trying. That impedes communication, one of many such cases. Uh, what's puzzling is that the association of the clause initial element, instinctively or can, to the verb, is remote and based on structural properties, not proximate and based on linear properties. It's a far simpler computational operation, but never used. The language makes use of a property of a minimal structural distance, never uses the much simpler property of minimal linear distance. And the puzzle is why this should be so, and not just for English, but for every language, not just for these constructions, but for every relevant construction. Uh, and children acquire it. They never make mistakes about it. They acquire it reflexively, even if they have uh, no data or very limited data. Uh, there is a very simple and plausible explanation for the fact that a child reflexively knows the right answer in these cases, even though evidence is slim or in fact non-existent often. The explanation is that linear order is simply not available to the language learner. It's one of those great principles that Jesperson was talking about. It's not available to the learner, to the child, so it never picks it. Uh, the child is, uh, is guided by a principle of universal grammar that restricts search to minimal structural distance, the more complex notion. I guess the only explanation I know. There's no other explanation that's ever been proposed. Many have been suggested, but that obviously don't work. Uh, the, this principle of minimal distance is quite extensively employed in a design of language and struct nature of language. It's presumably one case of a much more general principle that enters into uh, uh, that enters also into design and acquisition of language in other forms, uh, not restricted to language, may actually be a law of nature. Uh, call it uh, minimal computation. And uh, the evidence shows overwhelmingly, in fact, without exception, that invariably languages use the property of minimal structural rather than linear distance, every relevant case, even though, again, the one that's not used is computationally far simpler. Now, there's actually some supporting evidence in this case from neuroscience. Now, there's a research group uh, in Milan, uh, Andrea Moro, who many of you know is the linguist in the group. Uh, they studied uh, brain activity of subjects who are presented with two types of stimuli. Uh, these are invented systems invented systems conforming to UG and uh, others not conforming to UG. Uh, so for, in the latter case, for example, uh, invented language that puts the neg negative particle after the third word of a sentence in order to negate it. That's a rule which is far simpler than the one that's computationally than the one used in uh, every language it's known. Uh, what they found is that in the cases of conformity to UG, uh, the language areas, normal language areas of the brain are activated, not other parts. Uh, but when linear order is used, like in that rule for negation I suggested, uh, they suggested, I repeated, uh, when the 
linear orders used this kind of diffuse activation in the brain, suggesting that the people are treating it as a kind of a puzzle and not as language. And uh, there's other work by Neil Smith and Yanti Maria simply with a cognitively impaired but linguistically fluent subject who they've worked with and they reach pretty much the same conclusion. Uh, actually, there is a small industry in computational cognitive science that's attempted to show uh, that these properties of language can be acquired by statistical analysis of massive data. Actually, that's about the only topic that's been investigated beyond superficialities. Uh, every attempt that's clear enough to be investigated has been shown to fail uh, irremediably but it really doesn't matter because the efforts are beside the point in the first place. Uh, suppose they worked, which is virtually impossible. Uh, that would still leave untouched the only serious question. Why does language invariably use the complex computational property of minimal structural distance while never employing or even entertaining uh, the far simpler option of minimal linear distance? Uh, that industry is a good illustration of the unwillingness to be puzzled uh, that I mentioned earlier. And again, the willingness to be puzzled is the first step in serious scientific inquiry, as has been recognized in the hard sciences uh, since Galileo. Uh, a broader thesis is that linear order is never available for computation in the core parts of language. Uh, that involve syntax and semantics. Uh, of course, there is linear order, but uh, the thesis would be that it's a peripheral part of language, kind of tacked on. Uh, it's a reflex of properties of the sensory motor system. The sensory motor system doesn't allow us to speak in parallel or to produce structures. We have to, to get it through the sensory motor system, we have to put things in a linear order. Uh, so the order could just be a reflex of the fact that whatever's going on in the mind has to pass through this filter to get externalized, but has nothing special to do with language. And the sensory motor system itself is not specially adapted for language, except maybe in peripheral aspects. Uh, the parts that are essential for externalization and also perception appear to have been in place uh, hundreds of thousands, in part millions of years, uh, before language emerged. They're just kind of there. Well, the matter's not settled. This is one of the topics that is open, but I think there's quite substantial evidence uh, to show that the broader thesis may in fact be correct. Uh, so if that's true, as I suspect it is, then the basic property uh, has to be reformulated. Uh, not the way it's been in recent literature, including papers of my own. Rather, the basic property would be generation of an unbounded array of hierarchically structured expressions uh, mapping to the CI, the con conceptual intentional interface, basically the system of thought. Well, if that turns out to be true, as I think evidence is pointing us to, uh, then there's good reason to return to a traditional conception of language as an instrument of thought and to revise the common sense dictum accordingly, language is not sound with meaning, but meaning with sound. Uh, more generally, uh, some form of externalization, typically sound, though it appears to be modality independent. In fact, externalization is rarely even used. Uh, by far the most use of language never is externalized. It's, it's called internal dialogue or inner speech. Uh, that's 99.9% .9 of your use of language. It's virtually impossible to, it takes a tremendous act of will not to talk to yourself when you're awake, when you're asleep, uh, walking down the street, whatever it may be. It's just going on all the time. Now there isn't much research in, on this topic, unfortunately. There's some, it goes back to Vygotsky, there's been little research. Uh, and it conforms to what introspection uh, suggests, my introspection at least, you can try yours.
um, what reaches consciousness, I think, is just small fragments. And then fully formed expressions uh, can be instantly produced, instantly produced internally, but usually aren't, and produced far too quickly for articulators to be involved, or even instructions to articulators. And they're often not produced, even internally. That's quite an interesting topic, which, as I say, has been barely explored, could be subjected to inquiry. I think the reason it's not explored is that there's kind of a prejudice against studying uh, mental mental actions that don't reach consciousness, which is probably where almost everything is, but a lot of dogmas about how you shouldn't study that. You should, actually. Well, putting aside this issue and just looking at the what we know about the way language is designed and constructed, uh, like the examples I gave, now that gives good reason to take seriously the intuitions of Galileo, many others, that language is essentially an instrument of thought. It would then follow that externalization is an ancillary process, not just a reflex of properties of the sensory motor system, which have nothing special to do with language. Uh, and uh, there is further investigation that I think supports this conclusion. Now, if it's established, a lot of things follow. Uh, one thing that follows is that particular uses of uh, language that depend on externalization, uh, among them communication, which is one, not the only one, are even more peripheral aspects of language. Now, that's contrary to virtual dogma in the various fields, dogma that, however, has no serious support. It would also follow that much of the extensive speculation about language evolution, language origins, is just on the wrong track to begin with. Because if you look at it, most of it is about speculations about evolution of communication, which is some, looks like some peripheral aspect of language. Now, well, let's... Uh, this matter has not been studied, uh, but I suspect that the modern doctrine, I think dogma, uh, that holds that communication is somehow the essential function of language, I suspect that that derives from the influence of associationist and uh, behaviorist assumptions, which retain quite a strong grip, even among those who reject them, along with uh, highly oversimplified and quite untenable interpretations of modern evolutionary theory, evolutionary biology. That's an interesting question. I'll put it aside here. Well, let's return to the basic property, uh, now reformulated. Uh, the computational system of I language yields an unbounded array of hierarchically structured expressions mapping to the system of thought, the conceptual intentional interface, all, of course, unconscious and inaccessible to consciousness. Uh, there are then ancillary processes uh, which may or may not externalize these internal objects in some sensory modality. And there are analogous observations about perception. Uh, uh, naturally, we seek the simplest property of the simplest theory of the basic property, uh, the theory with the fewest arbitrary stipulations. Uh, each stipulation is, of course, a barrier to some eventual account if attainable, of the origin of language. And I stress eventual. I think we're very far from it. Uh, that's standard scientific method, so nothing to say about it. But we can ask uh, how far this resort to elementary scientific method will take us. Well, so we ask, uh, look into the nature of computational operations. Uh, well, every, there is a, uh, a simple computational operation which is embedded in some manner in every, every relevant computational procedure. It's a, an operation that takes two objects, call them X and Y, that have already been formed and constructs a new object, call it Z. Uh, let's call this operation merge. That's how it's called now. We now resort to the principle of minimal computation overriding principle. 
Uh, that dictates that neither x nor y is modified uh, in the course of the uh, operation merge. It, al it also follows that they're unordered, because that would be a further complication. And that's a conclusion that's quite plausible for language on other grounds, the kind I indicated. Uh, well, that uh, means that merge x, merge of x, y, merge x, y, that just gives the set containing x and y. Uh, that does not mean, of course, that the brain contains sets, as some current misinterpretations claim and dispute. Uh, but what it means is that whatever's going on in the brain, about which we know very little, uh, has properties that can properly be char characterized in these terms. Uh, just as we don't expect to find the Kekulé diagram for benzene in a test tube. It's understood in the science. There's a lot of confusion about it in linguistics. Well, suppose X and Y are merged and neither is part of the other. So that's, say, combining a read and that book to form the syntactic object that corresponds to read that book. Uh, name for that is external merge, two things separate from one another. Uh, suppose that one of them is a part of the other, say Y is part of X. So as in combining uh, which book and John read which book, taking which book's contained in John read which book, you merge it, you get which book John read which book. Now that surfaces as which book did John read by further operations that I'll come back to. Uh, that's an example of a ubiquitous property of language, ubiquitous phenomenon called displacement. Uh, phrases are heard in one place, but they're interpreted both there and somewhere else. Uh, and the sentence in this question, case is understood as, for which book X, John read the book X. That's interpreting which book John read which book, okay? That goes straight to the thought system, comes out the right way. Well, in this case, the result of merge of X and Y is again the set containing X and Y, but now it has two copies of Y. One of them is the original one remaining in place. The other is the copy that's merged with the whole thing. Now that's called internal merge, sometimes called the copy theory of movement, but it's, it's the minimal theory, the optimal theory comes for free. Uh, external and internal merge are the only two possible cases of binary merge, and there's pretty good evidence that these operations are binary. And it's important to bear in mind that both of them come free. It would be a complication if you had only one and not the other, whichever way it went. It would require a stipulation of some kind to bar one of them because they're free. And that's an important fact. Its importance has gradually sunk in since it was noticed about 15 years ago. Uh, for many years it was assumed by me as well that displacement, this ubiquitous phenomenon, is a kind of an imperfection of language, kind of a strange fact that has to be explained away by some more complex devices, complex assumptions about universal grammar. But that turns out to be incorrect. Displacement is what you should expect on the simplest assumptions, assumptions with no stipulations, just everything works perfectly. Language forms kind of like the way a snowflake does, just the simplest possible way. It would be an imperfection if one, um, displacement were lacking. That's significant. And another important fact is that internal merge in its simplest form, satisfying the overarching principle of minimal computation, uh, yields the structure that's appropriate for semantic interpretation. It's just illustrated in the simple case of which book did John read? The right form for semantic interpretation is which book John read which book. Goes right to the thought system, gets interpreted the right way. Uh, however, these are of course the wrong structures for the sensory motor system. Uh, universally in language, only the structurally more prominent copy is pronounced, as in the case I mentioned, the lower copy is deleted. 
there actually is a revealing class of exceptions, which in fact support the general thesis, but I'll put that aside. Uh, why deletion of copies? Well, that follows from another application of the overarching principle of minimal computation, namely compute internally and articulate as little as possible. That's obvious principle of minimal computation. Now, there's a result. The result is that the articulated sentences have gaps. And incidentally, the same is true for inner speech. So you talk to yourself, it has gaps. Uh, and uh, that's tricky because the hearer has to figure out where the missing element is. Uh, that, it's well known in the study of perception and parsing that that yields quite difficult problems of interpretation. Uh, fill or gap problems, they're caused. One of the hardest problems if you're writing a parsing for a program and similarly for perception. Uh, now, in this very broad class of cases, something interesting has happened. Uh, the design of language, the basic structure of language, is favoring minimal computation, and it's disregarding the complication in the use of language. That's significant, too. Uh, notice also that if some theory comes along, there are many of them, that replace internal merge by some other mechanism, uh, that theory has a double burden of proof to bear. The first part is to explain why it has the stipulation barring internal merge, which otherwise comes free. And secondly, it has to justify whatever new devices are uh, 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 formulated to uh, yield displacement. In fact, displacement with copies, notice, which is generally the right form for semantic interpretation. Uh, strain your imagination a little by giving one more complex case. Not too complex, I hope. But uh, so take the sentence, uh, which of his pictures did they persuade the museum that every painter likes best? Okay, that's derived by internal merge from the underlying structure. Uh, which of his pictures uh, did they persuade the museum that every painter likes which pictures of his, uh, which of his pictures best. It's derived by deletion of copies from that. Now that one is formed directly by internal merge with displacement and two copies. Uh, so same as which book, did John read which book? In this case, uh, which of his pictures did they persuade the museum that every painter likes which of his pictures best? Uh, the uh, phrase, which of his pictures, is understood to be the object of likes, where the gap is in pronunciation. It's quite analogous to one of his pictures in they persuaded the museum that every painter likes one of his pictures best. You get the same interpretation even if there's a gap. And that's just what the underlying structure with two copies provides. And that has further consequences. There's a quantifier variable relationship between every and his, and that carries over. So which of his pictures, suppose you say, uh, which of his pictures did they persuade the museum that every painter likes best? Uh, the answer can be his first one. Uh, that's different for every painter. It's exactly the same as the one of the interpretations of they persuaded the museum that every painter likes one of his pictures best. Now, in contrast, no such answer is possible for the structurally similar expression, which of his pictures persuaded the museum that every painter likes flowers? Structurally the same, but you don't get the quantifier variable interpretation. In that case, his pictures doesn't fall within the scope of every painter. Well, evidently, it's the unpronounced copy that provides the structure that's required for quantifier variable binding. And the results follow directly from the simplest form of merge, internal merge, and copy deletion, also required by minimal computation, very much as in the simpler case that I mentioned. And if you go on, there are many much more intricate cases. Well, in all of these cases, just like instinctively eagles that fly swim, it's inconceivable that some form of data processing yields these outcomes. 
There's no point even trying. No conceivable way that could be. Uh, relevant data simply are not available to the language learner. Uh, the results must therefore derive from what David Hume called the original hand of nature. In our terms, that means genetic endowment, specifically UG, universal grammar. And in ways like this, we can derive quite far-reaching and quite firm conclusions about the nature of UG, uh, solving some strange puzzles. Well, there are many claims in the literature that there are no general, uh, genuine linguistic universals, hence no UG, the linguists above, among you are familiar with this. However, the reference is, if it's not just confusion, uh, the reference is presumably not to UG, to universal grammar, but rather to descriptive generalizations. Uh, Joseph Greenberg's famous universals, for example. But generalizations are quite likely to have exceptions. That's the nature of generalizations. And these are very valuable as a stimulus to inquiry. Uh, exceptions to deletions of copies, for example, uh, which I mentioned, and in fact reinforce the main principle when you look at them closely. Uh, that's quite standard in the sciences. So take one famous case, uh, discovery of perturbations in the orbit of Uranus. Uh, did not lead to the abandonment of Newton's principles and Kepler's laws, or to the broader conclusion that there are no physical laws, the kind of thing that happens in linguistics and cognitive science, but in the sciences it didn't lead to that. And what it led to was uh, inquiry, postulation, later discovery of another planet, Neptune. Then turned out everything worked. Uh, exceptions to largely valid generalizations play a similar role quite generally in the sciences and have done so repeatedly in the study of language. Another point to bear in mind. Uh, well, what we conclude, I think, is that if, if language is optimally designed, it will provide structures which are appropriate for semantic interpretation, but that yield difficulties for perception, hence for communication. There are many other examples that lead to the same conclusion. So structural ambiguities, garden path sentences. One case of particular interest is what's called islands, as illustrated in so-called ECP constructions, uh, sentences constructed from the underlying expression. They asked if the mechanics fixed the cars. You can ask how many cars, you can ask how many mechanics. Uh, that gives respectively uh, how many cars did they ask if the mechanics fixed, how many mechanics did they ask if fixed the cars. They're quite different in status. Uh, and uh, how many mechanics did they ask if fixed the cars is a perfectly fine thought, but you can't say it that way. You have to say it with some circumlocution, again, impeding communication. There are plenty of similar cases. A lot of them aren't understood, but to the extent that they're understood, invariably, I think, the examples, the structures result from free functioning of the simplest possible rules, yielding difficulties for perception, hence communication. Uh, where, where there are, if you look hard, you can find quite a few conflicts between communicative efficiency and computational efficiency, like the kind I just illustrated. And in every known case, uh, uh, communicative efficiency is sacrificed. It's never considered. Just go for computational efficiency. Uh, meaning, again, that language looks as if it's designed the way a snowflake is. That's just the way the principles of nature work. And if it impedes communication, too bad, as it often does. Well, that lends further support to the uh, revision of the common sense Aristotelian dictum and support for the view of language as an instrument of thought with uh, communication and other uses being ancillary properties, kind of tacked on, but nothing special to say about language. And I think that conclusion fits very well with the very limited evidence that we have 
about the emergence of language, apparently quite suddenly in the evolutionary time scale, as uh, Tattersall discussed, that one of the misinterpretations of modern biology that I referred to is the idea that changes have to be gradual. That was thought at one time, but by now massive evidence that it's not true, which is why Tattersall proposes this without comment, because it would be normal uh, evolution. Evolution is not natural selection, of course, and doesn't have to be gradual. Uh, there's a fair guess that, in fact, it's the only guess I know, that some slight rewiring of the brain yielded merge, uh, roughly in Tattersall's window, say, 50 to 100,000 years ago. Uh, that provided the basis for unbounded and creative thought, uh, what's sometimes called the great leap forward that's revealed in the archaeological record right about that period, and the remarkable differences separating uh, modern humans from their predecessors, any of them that we know of, and the rest of the animal kingdom. Well, uh, another comment is that, should, is that e every computational system uh, has to have a collection of elements that are atomic for the purposes of the computation, uh, though like atoms, they can be decomposable by other means. Uh, for language, these are what are called the lexicon, They're roughly word-like elements. Though I think it's, uh, I think there are good reasons to accept the uh, proposals at the origins of generative grammar about 60 years ago, that the notion word is really a phonological notion, not a syntactic notion. I think so, I won't go into it. Uh, well, whatever these elementary units are, uh, they pose another problem, a very se serious and deep problem for some eventual study of the origin of language, if it's ever possible to undertake it. Uh, the, the problem is, and also for acquisition of language, the problem is that these elementary elements, these atoms, uh, concepts, if you like, are quite different from anything found in animal systems, animal symbolic or communication systems. In the animal systems, it seems to be true that symbols conform to what's sometimes called the referentialist doctrine, namely that a symbol, uh, perhaps an animal cry, is associated with some mind-independent entity. So you have a, you know, verb that has a certain cry, that means uh, the leaves are fluttering or something. It's just one-to-one -one associated with that. Uh, uh, that seems to be universal for animal systems. Uh, but the, and the doctrine is typically assumed for language too. Just, you know, all the relevant fields accept the doctrine almost without exception. Uh, but it's just totally untenable. Uh, as soon as you uh, look closely at even the simplest words, you find that it just doesn't begin to hold. There's just no connection between an internal element, however simple, you know, the river, uh, table, uh, any rock, anything you pick up, uh, no direct connection between that and some mind-independent entity. Uh, always involves some mental constructions of some much more complex kind. A lot of study of this in the last 40 years. I think the doctrine, though it's still hold, held almost universally, just can't be accepted. That's another important topic that I'll just mention and put aside. And incidentally, one that's very poorly understood and insufficiently studied because of the power of the referentialist doctrine. I think it's false, but it's very powerful. So it's you find it everywhere. Another topic to be discussed, to be investigated. Well, these remarks, of course, only scratch the surface. Uh, what I hope is that they'll illustrate why the answer to the question, what is language, actually matters a lot. And also, I hope we'll illustrate how close attention to this fundamental question can yield conclusions with uh, considerable ramifications for the study of what kind of creatures we are. Thanks. <laughs>
side is okay? Either side That's is okay? fine. Okay. okay. Both, um, equal, both sides equally bad. Uh, I, I apologize <laughs> if I will only speak in English. Um, we have a little over 20 minutes for discussion. Um, I will be aided in this uh, activity by assistance with microphones who will, uh, and I'll ask you to pose your questions to the microphone. I'll also be added by my youngster colleague over here, Dominique Sportiche, whose ears are very good, who will help make sure that your questions get through to Professor Chomsky. I will also ask you to follow some ground rules in order to make best use of the time we have. Uh, first, I'll ask you to keep your questions to issues raised by his remarks here rather than to broader range of topics. Uh, I'll also ask you to keep your questions short because they'll have to be repeated. Um, and uh, finally, I'll ask you to keep your questions questions rather than statements. <laughs> um, I'll do my best to... Uh, uh, the, there are lights up there that are in my eyes, which may make it a little hard for me to keep track. But I'll do my best to distribute questions around the room, but please don't be upset if you're trying very hard and somehow you don't get my attention. Okay, so... Questions, questions can be in French. I'm sorry? Questions can be in French. Oh, yes, right. Also, because uh, Professor Spotish <laughs> is here to assist, questions can be in French, but they have to be short and to the point, too. <laughs> But, of course, we know they will follow the natural logic of thought. <laughs> okay, so, uh, surprisingly, I don't see any hands up. There's a hand. All right. Could we have the microphone over here, please? Is it, is it on? Yes. Um, um, I would like to, uh, to know something about the, um, the um, emergence, or how can I say that, internal, um, what's, I, I don't know how to, how to formulate that exactly, because it's not reached my consciousness yet. So it has to do with that. Um, you, you mentioned the fact that, you know, we have internal or personal language even before it reaches consciousness. I'm, I don't mean articulation, but consciousness itself. And I was wondering whether what precedes that uh, can be considered language in the sense that do you think it is structured and do you think that it corresponds to what we think language is? I don't know whether my question is clear. Yes. Well, are you going to translate these into French? Uh, oh, oh, so, so yeah. you, you get, you, I, get, I get his answer. Okay, thank you. He's got a double translation problem. He has to translate into French and translate into English for me. Oh, oh you want me to just... To, if I've understood correctly your question, you're asking something about the subconscious. Yes, the question is the following. Language that we call subconscious or unconscious, can it be considered to be language? Does it have a structure? Or is it when it reaches conscience that this can be considered to be language? or subconscious language, uh, in, in what sense is it a language? Uh, what kind of structure does it have? What kind of properties can we attribute it? Uh, I think it's, it actually is language. Uh, what's not beyond the level of consciousness looks like just some kind of fragments that reach consciousness occasionally or externalized, usually not. And that doesn't seem to me surprising. Uh, most, most of what's going on in the mind is completely inaccessible to consciousness. And by now there's even experimental work showing it. Uh, it's against, that's contrary to dogmas. Now, there's a philosophical dogma that's pretty strong that says uh, anything in the mind has to be accessible to consciousness. It goes way back. Modern versions are attributable to uh, W.V. Quine, John Searle, others, but old doctrines, just seems to be completely false. Uh, most of what's going on is in, appears to be inaccessible to consciousness. So what properties does it have? Well, it has the properties that we try to discover by looking at the scattered evidence that does, is available to us. And that's just normal science. 
uh, you don't see, uh, in fact, a couple of days ago, uh, there was the first picture ever of uh, what happens to a molecule in the course of a chemical uh, uh, process. Uh, plenty was known about it, a lot was assumed about it, but nobody ever saw it before. So this is a nice technological uh, development, but it's not going to change chemistry uh, for hundreds of years. The chemical theory was developed uh, just looking at whatever data you have. And that's uh, the way science works. I mean, one famous line is that science is concerned with discovering the hidden, simple invisibles that account for complex visibles. That's science. In fact, it's rational inquiry. And uh, we shouldn't be surprised that the same holds in this case, as I think it does. So what properties does this internal system have? Well, it, apparently it has the kind of problems that, properties I mentioned. So for example, it doesn't use linear order. It just uses uh, 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 minimal structural distance, which probably follows from minimal computation, which probably means, this is a further guess, that when language emerged, it emerged without any selectional pressures. So it just took the form of a natural object, kind of like a snowflake. Uh, it, since there were no selectional pressures, this mutation, whatever it is, is happening to an individual. It's just going to take the form of a, an object naturally formed in accord with the principles of uh, uh, natural law, probably minimal computation in this case. And as far as we understand anything, which is pretty limited, that seems to be pretty much the case, I think. And not surprising. If you think about if Tattersall is right, you know, that this is sudden emergence of something in a narrow time scale, that's what you'd expect. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for a very interesting lecture. Uh, I would like to ask about the relationship between atoms of thought and atoms of language. And is all thought language? Uh, am I thinking when I'm driving down the freeway, for example? Is, is, that, is, is that thought involving language? Okay. Donc, quelle est, quelle est la relation entre les atomes de la pensée et les atomes du langage Et en particulier, je n'ai pas compris la suite. Euh, quand, on, quand on conduit sur l'autoroute... Exactement. Donc, est-ce que toute pensée est thought langage ou non Est-ce que, est que toute pensée est langage ou non so is, what's the relation between the atoms of language and the atoms of thought is, uh, is, uh, <laughs> okay. that's funny. And, um, is a, you, any kind of thought language or not? Well, we, we have very little information about what thought is. In fact, it's not even really very clear how you could have such information. But uh, a lot of our, the mass of our information about thought is what we get by looking at language. So that yields the suggestion that, say, Humboldt took to an extreme, that they're the same. But again, you can introspect if you like. It's the only kind of evidence we have. It doesn't look as if they're the same. There seems to be lots of kinds of thought that just never can get articulated. And I don't see any reason to doubt that some kind of thought is going on with, non uh, with organisms that don't have language. Uh, uh, there is. Uh, you know, there's a, in, in, cognitive, in computational cognitive science, there's a big enterprise, which in my view is a total waste of time, which goes back to a misreading of a very short paper by Alan Turing. Uh, back in 1950, Alan Turing, great mathematician, the founder of modern computational science and so on. Uh, he had a paper called uh, something like Do Machines Think? And that's led to, and he devised a test. It's now called the Turing test. He called it an imitation game. And uh, there's been a lot of effort to try to, and he, what he argued is if, uh, or what he's been interpreted as arguing, he didn't say it, is that if a machine, machine means program, not, not a physical computer, but a program, if a program can uh, pass this test, that'll show that it thinks. 
And uh, if you're an employee of IBM, you get paid to construct Watson and other huge programs that are supposed to pass the test. You know, they defeat people in chess or Jeopardy or something. Uh, what everyone, uh, and you can get $100,000 if you, if you pass the, uh, if you construct such a program. There's one line in Turing's paper which seems to have been ignored. What he said is, the question whether machines think is too meaningless to deserve discussion. Okay, and he's right. The question whether machines think is like asking whether submarines swim, let's say. If you want to call that swimming, yeah, they swim. Uh, if you don't want to call it swimming, they don't. But it's not a factual question. It's uh, the humans fly. I think in Japanese they do, somebody told me, but in English they don't. But, uh, but these are not factual questions. They're questions about how we only use the word. Now, there is something going on that we loosely refer to as thought, but we don't know much about what it is. And, uh, a, and we'll never find out as long as attention is restricted to what's accessible to consciousness. Uh, some of you may know that there are recent experimental results showing that decisions about, say, motor action, like whether to pick this up, that the decision is actually made microseconds before you're aware of making the decision. That's been misinterpreted as an argument about freedom of will, as if it nothing to do with freedom of will. What it means is that decisions are made in a way that's inaccessible to consciousness. Okay, I don't think that should surprise anyone who's alive and has ever thought about what they do. But uh, it is contrary to a widely held dogma. And I, sus I think that dogma has to collapse if we're going to learn about these things. Um, Professor Chomsky, how would you qualify the influence of new technologies on the traditional languages? I mean by that especially, which is uh, used now by, well, younger generations, all those chats, tweets, SMS, where you have shortcuts, you have signs, you have smileys, uh, all of that, which is probably much more used than you know, the normal words nowadays. Um, so how would you think, what, what kind of uh, influence it has and how it can evolve um, afterwards, the language uh, we are used to or we were uh, trained to use in our, in our school time? Donc, uh... <clears throat> <laughs> Que euh, pensez-vous qu'il y a une influence des technologies modernes de communication comme les textos, euh, le chat, etc. sur euh, le langage euh, et, donc, euh, et si oui, quelle est-elle What kind of influence do you think modern technologies have, such as you know, text messages, uh, chats, and so on, on uh, language You got to ask somebody 60 years younger than I am. <laughs> But, uh, I can answer that. Then. You can answer it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, I, don't, I don't think it has any effect on language except kind of the way, say, teenage slang constantly has effects on language. So it's one of the ways languages change. Teenagers have slang. It becomes the accepted language of the next generation. And I guess that's probably going on here, too. I know I get lots of... Uh, letters, especially for my grandchildren, uh, which I can barely understand. But they have to be, <laughs> somebody has to decode them for me. They're full of things like LOL and all sorts of other stuff. <laughs> so, so it's a kind of a superficial impact, but I can't imagine it has much of an effect. Professor Chomsky, um, you did a, lots of, uh, a lot of work in politics, and um, as you know, uh, language uh, has a uh, crucial um, role in uh, politics and society. I'm just wondering how it is possible to decontextualize language um, from society and uh, politics, everything. Thank you. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we, we missed a crucial piece of your question. You're talking about the relationship between language and politics, right? And society. So, the, the, so je vais traduire. La, la relation qu'il existe entre le langage, la politique et euh, la société. Et I can't hear you. Yeah, too much noise. Um, from the formalist point of view, Professor is a big formalist. <laughs> and from the other point, part, uh, he is very big uh, political person. Uh, he did a very great um, uh, work in uh, political, uh, and he, uh, yes. Uh, so I'm just wondering how it is possible to decontextualize language from society, um, uh, um, politics, everything. Donc, euh, comment est-il possible de, de, de décontextualiser, de séparer le langage du, des, des contextes dans lesquels il est utilisé, comme par exemple la politique, la, 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 les, les considérations sociales, etc. So, uh, how is it possible to decontextualize language from its context of use, such as politics, social context, and so on? Well, uh, the way I was discussing, I mean, in the examples I was discussing, I didn't pay any attention to how sentences like these are used. And the same would be true if these were sentences not just picked for examples, but uh, used for, say, some political purpose, mainly for maybe for propaganda or for domination or control or whatever. The language can be used for all kinds of things. And if you want to understand the nature of language, you have to kind of factor that out and ask, uh, what, is, what are the means that are being used for this wide variety of purposes? Uh, that's, uh, you know, again, that's just, if you're interested in the question, what's the nature of language? What kind of creatures we are? Uh, how, does, uh, the, how, how do our creative abilities reside in something that emerged maybe 75,000 years ago, that's what you have to do. You're certainly right in that the uses of language have all kinds of consequences, uh, but, uh, but, but that's, the language itself doesn't care about that. The language doesn't care if you use it to tell the truth or if you lie or you, you use it for liberation or you use it for domination or whatever. It's just kind of a tool. A hammer, for example, is a tool. The hammer doesn't care if you use it to build a house or uh, crush somebody's skull, uh, uh, whatever else you do with it. It's just there, it has certain properties. And language is just a complex tool. It's uh, one that's at the core of our existence and it's internalized in our minds, but the way you use it is up to you. That's a different question. You can use it in all kinds of ways. Uh, my question is, why is language so efficient? And are there perhaps alien life forms who are, who are more unfortunate and have more complex operations than merge? Donc, euh, pourquoi le langage est-il so, uh, si efficace, uh, si performant? Et uh, existe-t-il uh, d'autres formes uh, de vie qui possèdent des systèmes qui sont uh, are there aliens with uh, more complex operations? Peut-on imaginer l'existence d'extraterrestres avec des systèmes plus complexes que Merge? So, why is language so efficient? And uh, can we imagine extraterrestrial beings or aliens mm -hmm. with uh, more powerful systems? Well, actually, language is not efficient. Uh, I, w I gave examples to show that the actual design of language 
is such that its use is often highly inefficient. It impedes communication. So it takes a filler gap problems or use of uh, you know, structural versus linear distance. This all makes language hard to use. Uh, actually, there's a sentence that I wrote once about 20 years ago, which scandalized lots of people. So maybe I'll repeat it, including. It says, it, 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 there's a certain sense in which language looks like it's beautiful but unusable. It's, of course, an exaggeration, but that's intended to capture what I think is something that does emerge from the study of language, that its basic design is kind of like a snowflake, as I said. It's just beautifully designed, but that gives many cases where it's hard to use. Uh, gave some examples, there are plenty of others. I mean, ambiguous ends, for example. And uh, structural ambiguities, not verbal ambiguities, they're not interesting. But, uh, uh, you know, we use it in, uh, of all the possibilities of using it, you use the ones that are easy to comprehend. I mean, you just don't use the others. They're hard for you to produce. They're hard for other people to understand. But that doesn't tell you what the design of language is. To find out what it is, you have to do the kind of inquiry that I was talking about. We really only have time for one more question. Here, there is a question. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, about 10 years ago, there was a study published in Science with a comparison of the genome of the chimp and humans. And it was found that some of the main dis differences was in the proteins and the genes involved in hearing so that chimps may actually not understand words because they don't hear the words. So I wonder whether you could speculate to what extent you think that the ability to hear has contributed to the ability to attribute meaning to sounds and to develop thought. And I can traduire que uh, il y a 10 ans, il y avait une étude uh, parue sur science qui a montré, euh, comparé le génome de chimpanzés et des humains, et a montré que euh, parmi les différences les plus marquantes, c'était la euh, des gènes euh, euh, impliqués dans l'ouïe. Dans et donc, euh, je demande si euh, je pense que l'habilité d'entendre de no, certains the, sons, certains euh, bruits, euh, ont contribué à la possibilité d'attribuer un, 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 un significat uh, et donc de développer la pensée. Well, if I understand, the question is about the very close overlap between the genes of uh, humans and yes. chimps. Actually, there's pretty close overlap between the genes of humans and yeast. Uh, the reason is that as is now increasingly coming to be understood, uh, there's uh, just not a lot of variation in organisms. I mean, at the time when Martin jo Jost, the person I quoted, uh, gave the Boazian tradition that languages can vary in arbitrary ways and each one has to be studied independently, it was also believed by leading biologists that the same is true of organisms. Uh, that you look at the variety of organisms, it just looks endless. So it, it was proposed that organisms can differ in every possible way, and every one you study has to be studied on its own. By now, that's been chipped away very significantly, a lot of it by uh, the leading French scientists like Francois Jacob, Jacques Monod, and others who discovered regulatory genes, uh, genes that control the operation of other genes. Uh, and it's since then been discovered that uh, there's a very high degree of conservation in genetic structure. In fact, it's even been proposed by a, uh, uh, an American uh, uh, molecular biologist, and it's taken seriously, maybe people don't agree, but it's not considered absurd that there's only one animal uh, just minor variations of it. Uh, they all, all the animals, in fact, plants that we know came around the Cambrian explosion, and a form was established, and after that you get minor variations. It doesn't look absurd, 
and serious biologists take it seriously. And that's, uh, so the overlap between uh, chimps and uh, humans in the number of genes just doesn't mean anything. You get very small differences in, say, the operation of timing of regulatory mechanisms, which give you totally different organisms. Uh, Jacob's proposal, I think this was maybe 40 years ago, is that slight changes in timing and organization of regulatory mechanisms could give you the difference between a fly and an elephant, let's say. And uh, that, something like that seems to be true. So there are slight differences, there would look like slight differences between humans and chimps or humans and mice and humans and yeast, but those slight differences make quite a difference phenomenally. <laughs> I'm sure that there's no one in the room who wouldn't like to speak further with Professor Chomsky, but I'm afraid our time is up, and we have to thank him. And thank you.